The following is a production of New Mexico State University. Eating quietly if possible, but we want you to be well fed. Aren't you delighted to see so many young soldiers and, uh, and air, airmen here today? Isn't that great? We, we specifically wanted to include all the ROTC units, both high school and college here, to hear the general. And they were great to come out to do this. And I understand the general had an opportunity to speak to them also just a little bit before they came in here to eat. But we think it's wonderful to have ROTC programs here and to train future leaders of Air Force and Army. Uh, I'm now delighted to introduce a longtime friend of mine, uh, former Congressman Manuel Lujan, former Secretary of the Interior. He spent 20 years in the House of Representatives, House of Representatives representing the northern part of the state. Shortly after that, he thought he had retired. He thought he had retired and uh, was selected by the president to serve as Secretary of the Interior. I learned my first and very basic political lesson from then Congressman Lujan. Well, two basic lessons, and I share them with young people to this very day. We went to Los Alamos one time when I was a young chairman of the Republican Party, and uh, there was a big gathering. There were, there were a few Republicans in Los Alamos, as I recall, and uh, Congressman Lujan was there, and, uh, and a candidate from go for governor was along with us, a, a fellow named Joe Skeen, who later became a congressman. And so Joe Skeen and I went inside the hall, and Joe Skeen got in an argument with three or four people from Los Alamos, as Joe Skeen was inclined to do from time to time. And I wandered around looking lost most of the time. And after that, after that dinner, the congressman took me aside and he told me two things. And I had witnessed that he stood at the door. He said, item number one, if you want to be a politician, you stand at the door and you greet everyone that comes in the door. And there'll be pressure behind him to keep him moving so you don't have to talk to him too long. And he says, everybody tonight will say that I talked to Congressman Lujan. And they did, because he stood at the door. And the other thing, he, he grabbed my name tag from the left side and put it on the right side, and he says, you need your name tag on the right so they can read it. Now that is the best political lesson I ever received in my whole life. And this is one of the great New, Mexica, New Mexicans of all time, a people person, a great congressman, a great secretary of the interior, Manuel Lujan. Gary, thank you very much. Uh, you know this, and welcome all of you to this uh, to this luncheon. This is the uh, the biggest audience we've had uh, at any of our luncheons or dinners or uh, or the uh, the receptions. And uh, you know, we're very fortunate uh, to have General Selva because he's uh, not only met with all of the uh, ROTC students a little uh, while ago, but we have, as Gary mentioned, about a hundred of them here um, to uh, to listen uh, to him. Um, uh, to Senator Dimension, since this is the last time that I'll be have an opportunity to be up here, let me just uh, say how wonderful it is that we have this uh, uh, this conference. And, and as a matter of fact, the whole institute is just just great. I notice he's getting more and more popular. Everybody was waving at him when he came in, but. You know, as opposed to when he was in office, they're using all their fingers or their hands now <laughs> when they wave at him. So, so uh, anyway, congratulations to you, Pete. And let me, uh, my job here today is to introduce to you Lieutenant General Paul Selva. He is the uh, Assistant Chairman to the Joint Chief of Staff in, uh, in Washington, D.C., and we're glad that he was able to, uh, to get here. Uh, he um, graduated from the, uh, I'm not going to go to all of it, because I've got a whole paper full of stuff that, two pages full, so I'm not going to go through it. My speech will be longer than his if I, if I do that. But uh, he graduated from the Air Force Academy in uh, 1980. Um, he uh, serves as a command, or did, uh, uh, as a command pilot uh, uh, with more than 3,100 hours. And all of the big airplanes, it seemed like to me, like... Uh, they have them, um, the C-5, the 17, the, all of it. But anyway, they're the great uh, big uh, airplanes. He's got a bachelor's degree, um, uh, science degree in aeronautical engineering from the Air Force, a master of science uh, degree in management and human relations from uh, Abilene Christian, 
Master of Science degree in political science from Auburn. Uh, so, you know, he's, uh, his background is well suited for the work that, uh, that he does. His assignments have been, you know, just, you can't imagine, but all the way from a co-pilot and aircraft uh, commander for the 917th Air Refueling uh, uh, Squadron, all the way to commander of, of, of all those, uh, of all of those different, uh, different units. He is, uh, as I say, present assistant to the chairman of the Joint uh, Chief of Staff. He has distinguished service medal, Legion of Merit, uh, meritorious uh, service medal. So, you know, I could go on and on and on, but uh, suffice, uh, that gives you an idea of, uh, you know, the kind of gentleman that we have here today. And we, of course, are very fortunate to have people like him that decide to serve this country. And so, General, would you please come up and give us a Secretary Lujan, thank you very much for that uh, gracious introduction. I think your expectations are probably higher than my ability to deliver. Senator Domenici, thank you so much for the work that you have done across your entire life of public service, but in particular for establishing the Institute. Uh, I, I find it very valuable in our society where people will sit down and have conversations about things of import nationally in terms of national security, but also as they relate to the region from which those people uh, um, hail and to the, the region that they share their borders with. And in this particular case, you find yourself in a very unique situation. Uh, I should tell all of you that I would miss somebody if I tried to do all of the protocol. And I learned a little trick in Africa about 10 days ago. And it's, it's to use the term all protocol observed. It's fascinating. It saves you the time of having to go through a, a fairly long list of special people in the audience. All of you are special and therefore all protocol observed. Uh, one or two of you have probably noticed that huddled behind the podium I have a cup of coffee. It's because I am a certified caffeine abuser. I have been for a long time. There's a story behind how I got this way. I tell it every time I speak in public. And the story happened in November of 1960, uh, about 9,000 feet over the Atlantic Ocean on an Air Force airplane. Uh, a young two-year-old boy was sitting next to the exit window over the right wing on an Air Force C-47, uh, let's see, they were called Skytrains. And the young boy was fascinated by this circular red handle with a piece of copper safety wire. And, and this particular young boy reached over and grabbed the handle and with all his might turned it counterclockwise 90 degrees. And at that instant, the window streamlined to the side of the airplane and the young boy was on his way out of the airplane being pulled out by the suction from the right side engine, which aviators would tell you would be the number two motor. At that very instant, as all this was happening, the second lieutenant co-pilot was on his way back to the coffee pot to charge his cup of coffee. He saw what was going on. He dove onto the two-year-old, grabbed him by his farmer John's, pulled him back into the airplane, buckled his seatbelt, cinched it down as tight as he could, which was not going to be adequate, pulled the window back into place, locked the latch, pointed at the red handle, and said, do not touch that. Again, I'm sure he had some explaining to do when he finally got back up to the cockpit with his cup of coffee because there was a horrendous amount of noise as the two-year-old's mother gave him the business for opening the window. Uh, but, but the flight ended, as we say in safety reports, uneventfully, <laughs> but for the following. As he got out of his seat to do his post-flight, which for the co-pilot involved walking around the airplane inserting landing gear and safety pins, this young second lieutenant had the presence of mind to take that two-year-old out of his mother's arms and walk him around the airplane and give him back to his father. 
That young second lieutenant was a hero twice that day. My father reminds me of it all the time. <laughs> First, he saved my life by keeping me from getting pulled out of that window at 9,000 feet. And second, he saved my life by taking me out of my mother's arms because when she got on the ground, she certainly would have beat me to within an inch of my life. <laughs> so what you need to know is I'm still looking for that second lieutenant. He's probably about 80 years old. Because the flight ended uneventfully, there is no official record of what he did. So if you hear that story firsthand from anybody but me, that means there's a clue in that conversation. My email is paul.selva at js.pentagon.mil. Send me a note because I want to give him a hug. Now, I will tell you, he did what every soldier, sailor, or airman, or marine would do faced with that same situation. He acted. He didn't consider what it meant to him. He only considered what it meant to me and my rather innocent and nonviolent mother who is sitting next to me. He certainly saved my life. He may have saved hers. But I want to meet him. So that's why I never speak without a cup of coffee in my hand. Believe it or not, my parents have never denied me coffee since that day. And my mother, who's 82, still swears she would not have beaten me within an inch of my life. But you didn't ask me to come talk about that uneventful day in November of 1960. It's the reason I'm here, but it's not why you asked me to come here. I would compliment you on the subject matter that you're talking about today, because national security in this current environment is a very, very tough problem to solve because the world is changing faster than most of us would imagine. Now, I, I used to be the Air Force strategist, so I actually have been issued a crystal ball. I happen to know its in-commission rate is only about 50%, and its reliability rate is only 25%, which means a, a, a set of dice or a rusty coffee can and a bunch of bleached out chicken bones are probably just as good. None of us can tell the future. None of us can tell the future. But if we step back and look at what's going on around us, we can see some changes that tell us where we're headed. And let me just try some on for size. Did any of you hear the announcement yesterday that Facebook is now a 300 million person population? If they were a country, they would be the size of the United States. Facebook conducts 6 billion transactions a day. That means all of us who get on there and say, hey, I had a really good morning this morning. I got my cup of coffee. I'm still looking for the lieutenant. 6 billion times people post and read off of Facebook every day. Think about what that means to a person who wants to do something bad. I can hide in the white noise. In this ubiquitous world of information, I can just be there. Don't believe me? I sat in a room with an executive from Google two and a half weeks ago, and he said, in an average month, Google handles three and a half billion queries. The first thing I thought about was, who did we ask when we didn't have Google? Three and a half billion questions a month on Google. The world has changed, were we watching? A young master's degree student at, I think it was Boston University, uh, created a thing called Napster almost 10 years ago. I still have, for those of you who are in college now, you won't recognize this term, I still have vinyl in my basement. I still have 33 and a third LPs in my basement. Napster fundamentally changed the entertainment industry and they missed it. 
Apple figured it out. That's how we got the iPhone and iTunes and the iPod, and all of us have them. Imagine an iPhone that has more power than the first computers on the space shuttle in the hands of a terrorist. What could they do with it? How complex does that make the world we live in? And then extend it one more step and say, and so what does that mean in the context of globalization, an economy that spans the world, a place where innovation now becomes ubiquitous because I can communicate with anybody I want to. About 41 people a minute are born in the United States. About 162 babies a minute are born in China. And about 200 a minute are born in India. What does that mean? What does it mean that between India and China, we're talking about two and a half billion people? What does it mean to us? It means the top 25% of the, the people on the IQ scale in China or India outnumber the entire population of the United States of America. When their colleges and universities get as good as ours, they will graduate more engineers than there are people in the United States of America. They will probably graduate summa cum laude, more people than graduate from every college and university in the United States. Do you think there's a smart one in the bunch? Do you think there's somebody that might invent the next leap ahead technology in that group? I would submit to you the odds are against us on this one. So what we have to do is take advantage of who we are and what we are. The fact that we have proven over time that we innovate faster than most cultures on the planet, that we are not bashful about teaching our children that that's an important thing to be able to do, that we are not afraid to stand up to say things like math and science are important because they teach you the logic of what the future is going to look like, not what the future looks like. And that we can be brave enough to say that the things we are teaching our children today will prepare them for the future, but we don't know what that future looks like. The jobs, in the top 10 jobs that are being competed for today in the job market didn't exist in 2000. They didn't exist in 2000. I gave a speech about two years ago in front of a group of PhD students at the Air Force Institute of Technology. They're all going to be aeronautical engineers. Well, they are aeronautical engineers. My undergraduate degree is in aeronautical engineering. I remember being really proud as a senior that I did a laboratory experiment on how you could reduce the drag on bombs to make them go farther. We used a wind tunnel. It was vastly expensive. It took a bunch of people to do the experiment. One of those students showed me the output of that experiment on a laptop, completely modeled with a piece of software, and it took him about 10 seconds. I spent an entire semester laboring over that equation. The tools that are in the hands of our young people today vastly overshadow the capability we had when we were their age. So that's sort of step one. The future is different than we expect it to be. If we try to predict it, the only thing that's certain is we will be wrong. But the fact that we look that far out and ask what the implications are for national security and how we might adapt our behavior serves us well. So how does that apply? What do we do in the military that's different today than we did 10 years ago? Our organizations are incredibly flat. In my last job outside of the Pentagon, I was the director of operations for U.S. Transportation Command. And on any given day, we had about 250,000 things moving in the system. I had complete visibility over all of that movement. Whether it was on a ship, a truck, a train, a bus, or an airplane, I could find it and divert it and change the outcome and make sure that our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines had the logistics support and the transportation that they needed to get their jobs done. Ten years ago, that was not possible. 
It w in fact, it was physically impossible. Today we do it, and we do it as a matter of course. In the joint staff, we've completely flattened the organization. A young major who has the answer to a question can get it to me on a web we call SkyWeb instantaneously. And I can have a conversation with him or her about whether or not I think they're right and loop their boss into the conversation and loop somebody overseas into the conversation with the click of a mouse. Capabilities unheard of just a few years ago. We have broken our organizations down into task forces and organizations that are focused on individual outcomes and empowered those organizations to make a difference. That is different. It is why we are able to adapt and innovate just a little bit quicker than our potential adversaries. But those are organizational things that have to be supported by structural change. The structural change, I would argue, has to come in our national security apparatus is to make it and keep it more relevant, to make it and keep it more affordable, and to make it and keep it more reliable. Doing that is a significant challenge. In case you missed it, in January we had a new administration come to town. They have asked us, as does every administration, to conduct a series of reviews. And their alphabet soup, the Quadrennial Defense Review, the Nuclear Policy Review, the Space Policy Review, the Cyber Policy Review. But in the end, what they are is a deliberate effort to understand what changes need to be made to keep our national security apparatus relevant, affordable, and reliable into the future. It is the same work that all of you are embarked on with this institute. So what are we up to? What makes us relevant? In the Quadrennial Defense Review four years ago, we made a commitment to move away from we, what we call the two major war strategy, which basically said we have to be able to fight two major, major conventional wars at approximately the same time about 30 days distant from one another. And that drove what we called a force shaping strategy that told us how many soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines we needed, how many ships, trucks, trains, planks, tanks, and helicopters we needed. And it defined our force structure. But that is not the fight we find ourselves in. It is not the threat we see to our national security. So we have had to adapt and adapt quickly to terrorist threats, to cyber threats, and now to potential space threats. And how has that happened? Well, many of you probably watched or heard the news about eight months ago that a satellite was plummeting towards Earth and we were worried about the fuel on the satellite because it's fairly noxious stuff. And if the satellite landed on land or didn't break up and landed in the ocean, it would do some fairly significant environmental damage. And in 30 days, from inception of the idea to the day we shot the missile off of an Aegis-class cruiser to destroy that satellite in orbit, we adapted an anti-ballistic missile system into an anti-satellite system and shot it at a target moving 27 and a half thousand miles per hour and scored a bullseye. That didn't happen by accident. It happened because brilliant people from institutions just like this university, worked the problem and worked it hard, and then gave us a reasonable probability of success. And that's the kind of adaptation that we need. It's the ability to say a year ago, our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines in Afghanistan cannot see the enemy clearly enough, and a year later, triple the number of intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance orbits over the country of Afghanistan, and then provide every army battalion with a handheld device that lets them see the full motion streaming video off of every one of those unmanned aerial vehicles real time, and then take it a step further. If the thing I'm looking at is a threat, I want to be able to ask, we call it calling for fires, ask somebody to kill it. 
to render it no longer relevant as a threat. And how might I do that? And somebody said, well, you know that thing George Madden uses on Sunday afternoon football where he draws the line, puts a circle around, and says this guy's going to tackle that guy, and this guy gets credit? Wouldn't it be really cool if the guy on the ground identifying the target could put a circle on it and say, please make this go away, hit send, have it go to an airplane at 35,000 feet, and in the cockpit, the pilot sees the same picture and says, I can do that for you. And then at another place, a thousand miles distant, an intelligence analyst looks at the same picture and says, okay, if you do that, this will be the outcome. And then all three of them say, yep, that's what we want. And then the difference in the, what we call the kill chain is the time of flight of the bomb to the target or the artillery round to the target. Because the guy on the ground doesn't care who makes it go away. He just wants it gone. That sort of innovation, that innovation engine, where a soldier says, I got a problem, an airman says, I got a solution, a Marine says, I know how to fix that, and we put it all together into a joint solution, makes us more powerful than our adversaries. It makes us significantly more powerful than our adversaries. But I said it's got to be more than just reliable, it has to be affordable. And this is another component of what you all are thinking about that I would compliment. Every demand we place on our economy is a demand from another part of that economy. So if we as the defenders of national security don't pay attention to the price we reap on the rest of our economy, then we are not doing our job. Now one of you in the room is saying, geez, you guys do your budget in billions. And you know, a billion here, a billion there, pretty soon you're talking real money. And there's another one of you in the audience saying, we know you have not met a program you have not fallen in love with. And there's a third one out there that says, I defy you to show me a program you have killed. And all of you would be partially right. All of you would be partially right. So what we have to teach ourselves is to assess the cost of the programs against the risk we're taking on the battlefield and in the battle space and determine their contribution to our national security and make sure they are worth it. And when they are not, we need to stop the programs. We need to find a different way. We need to be agile enough intellectually to say that path is not going to work and find a different way. I would submit to you that work is in progress, but this requires constant attention. Because budgets are the ultimate in the theory of unintended consequences. When there isn't enough money, everybody defends to the death the program they love. You pick it, I don't care. It's true in every department of government. When there's too much money, we're sloppy. We don't set priorities, we buy everything we can get. That's the consequence of how we as a nation have chosen to build our budgets. I don't know of a better way. One of you does. Help us with that. It is a discipline we all deserve as citizens of the United States of America. It's a demand we make of ourselves every day and I will tell you it is a demand we often fail at. But finding a solution to this is really, really hard work. So. I invite you to join us. Help us solve that problem. And finally, not only does it need to be affordable, but it needs to be adaptable and reliable. And how do we do that? I'll tell you, I think the best way we do that is by not wishing we had a different organization, but by affecting the organization we have today. By deciding if we're gonna push responsibility down to lower levels, we're also going to empower those lower levels with the information they need to make good decisions and the authority they need to execute on those decisions. So when I tell a young Air Force captain or a, a Navy commander that they have the responsibility to do a task, it's theirs. And along with that responsibility comes the tools, the resources, and the authority 
to execute on their decisions. Now, if the decisions are too hard for them, and some are, or if the responsibility for the outcome of those decisions is beyond their experience and their grade, then we should take that responsibility ourselves as senior leadership, whether we are civilian or military. But we should push that responsibility down. The second thing we can do is better integrate inside of our own government. I have the privilege of being the chairman's liaison to the Secretary of State. That's probably the only thing I can say today that, that General Cartwright wouldn't have said in his speech, because he doesn't get to do that. I get to be with the Secretary, travel with her, witness her interaction with other heads of state and ministers of foreign affairs. And in the year I've been doing that, I have learned volumes about diplomacy, about the interaction of nations, about how the State Department and the Defense Department work together as two sides of the same coin. And how if we do our part, it's easier for state to do their part. If our military is strong and capable and present and credible in the area where our State Department is trying to negotiate a diplomatic solution, they are stronger for it. And our positions as a nation are more clearly heard. What better way to get our organs of government to work better together than to share our educational institutions? to actually have members of the State Department, Commerce, Transportation, and others in our military schools and allow us to attend theirs. To have military members present on the National Security Council and then the Political Military Affairs Bureau of the State Department and in other departments of our government and share that expertise one for one so we have diplomats and economists and transportation experts helping the Defense Department do our work. I would submit to you that's a solution that might work. And finally, I'll talk just a little about process, and then I'm told you might have a question or two for me, so uh, I'm going to submit to those questions so I can make this as long or as short as you want. I'm told that shortly after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, as, as we entered the nuclear age, Albert Einstein was quoted as saying something like, everything has changed except for our way of thinking. This nuclear age, which was born right here, changes everything. But we haven't changed the way we think about the world. And out of that observation, some would argue, grew the Cold War. I would submit we won that one. We won that one because of the work done here, the work done at Sandia, the work done in national laboratories to make our nuclear arsenal credible, to make sure that it was a tool that could be used to defeat the Russians, then the Soviets, and it worked well. But it was elegantly expensive. And the processes that derived from it linger. The processes that derived from it linger. Four separate services that work independently, which are today much more joint than we have been in our history, but there's a long way to go. Stovepipes within government that operate independently. A National Security Council layered over the top that purports to bring them together and does a magnificent job as far as it can go within the legal boundaries of what it's entitled to do but painfully inadequate in a world where information flows at gigabits per second, where threats move through fiber optic cables that are now 64,000 times more capable than they were the day we put them underground. Imagine that for a minute. It is now possible to move all of the written documents ever published by mankind through a fiber optic cable in seconds, in seconds. And if you want to store them, that's a trivial problem too. I still remember with great clarity, about 10 years ago, I gave a briefing and there was a space shuttle about to launch and it had an interferometric synthetic aperture radar on it. Don't ask me what they do, I just thought it was a cool thing to say. <laughs> it was going to take a radar map of the Earth. And I had written a paper with the six other guys 
a Marine, a couple of sailors, and a soldier, and another Air Force guy. And we basically said, wouldn't it be cool? It's not how we said it, but it's pretty close. Wouldn't it be cool if you could have a digital map of the world where things were measured to a meter? So mountains, treetops, buildings, roads, to within the accuracy of a meter. Wouldn't that be interesting? And from a military perspective, wouldn't it be cool if airplanes never banged into mountains again? Just tell the airplane where all the mountains are, hopefully the pilot's no good enough to miss them. Where if you put all this in with GPS and you're a soldier maneuvering on the ground and you sort of know where the enemy is, Somebody could build the equation that says bullets don't go through mountains very well, so your potential scheme of maneuver is up this valley, around this rock, and down on top of the enemy, and there's about a 99% potential he or she will not get a shot off on you, because you'll be covered the whole way. And it wouldn't it be cool if in every port in the world, Navy captains, skippers of ships, didn't have to worry about what the port looked like, because they could call it up and see it. Now, at the time, the guy I was given the briefing to looked not a lot unlike me. He was a fairly grizzled lieutenant general who sat there and said, my God, Colonel, do you know how much memory that would take? And do you know what it would take to transport that data around? No, sir. Well, it turned out he really was a rocket scientist, and he said, it would take two terabits of information storage to store all that information. Do you know how much two terabits is? Now, with the benefit of several years of experience, I can tell them it is less than the amount of memory my wife has on her Mac in her quilting studio in our house. I wasn't quite that smart then. My ability to see the future wasn't quite that clear. I knew it would be cool if we could have it, but I didn't know it would be possible. I didn't know somebody would invent Google Earth. I didn't know that that would become a framework by which you could pass that information. And if you put military information on that grid, that it would be a really good thing. I just didn't know that. I didn't know that our ability to move information would increase by exponential amounts in less than a decade. So where does that leave us? We need to do some work in-house and our vast along the way of doing it. We have reorganized units. We have changed the way we fight. Soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines today operate shoulder to shoulder in Iraq, Afghanistan, throughout Southwest Asia, and around the world. We share our information because the information is valuable, not because it's ours. It doesn't matter if the photograph or the video comes off of an Army system, an Air Force system, a Navy system, or a Marine system. We can put it in the hands of the people that need it. They can make the decisions they need to make. And if they have to ask permission, communicate that request and get the approval in seconds. And that changes the way we can apply military force on the battlefield. It changes the tool of military power with respect to national security. It is an advantage we must maintain. Because if we fail, if our adversary becomes one of those nations that outnumbers us a thousand to one in genius IQs, then we fail our nation. And we cannot afford to do that. So as we think about national security, I would suggest one man's humble opinion. We have to think about it in its totality. What does it mean not only to our nation, but to how we affect this global fabric that is our national security? How do we keep that weave tight enough that it keeps us secure, but loose enough that it allows the global economy to prosper? It allows us to have influence in place of power. That it allows us to shape an outcome as opposed to force an outcome that allows us to collaborate in this global environment while still maintaining our own national security. Thank you so much for your attention. I will submit to your questions if you have the patience.
Thank you very much, uh, General. You know, it's interesting how that information age has changed everything in your message today and how the military is adapting to it. You know, that's very, very interesting for the, for the rest of us. You made a, a comment about, you know, the nuclear age starting here in New Mexico. I don't know how many of you realize it, <clears throat> but so did the information age. Over on Central and San Pedro, roughly, is where Bill Gates and Paul Allen started their little company, which later became Microsoft. So, you know, maybe we're here in, in New Mexico are responsible for all the problems that you're having throughout, <laughs> throughout the world now. We are going to entertain uh, questions, and as we have, we have from the students uh, two questions, and then from the general public two questions, and then from Senator Domenici, who uh, sometimes has a comment for you and sometimes has a question. So let's start with a couple of uh, questions from the students. Let's start with one of them. Somebody, somebody raise their hand out there. Yes. We have a mic over here for you. Thank you, sir. Hi, my name is Erin Griffith, and I wanted to ask you what we need to change in our education policy to meet the future demands of the science and technology that you need for national security. That's a, that's a fabulous question. Um, I am trained as a classic engineer, and, and I would be unfair to my roots if I didn't say, I think a disciplined application of math and science are critical. We, we have to educate our, um, our young men and women to understand the value of where that can take them, but it is simply insufficient. The problem is I can't tell you what to study and I'm not sure I could suggest education policy that gets us past the fundamentals. Because if, if you believe what I told, anything about what I told you, about 30 seconds after I give you my answer, it's no longer relevant. Because technology's moving that fast. So I, so I think the key is math and science as fundamental foundational studies. It doesn't mean everybody has to be a mathematician or an engineer, but there's a discipline in studying those topics that helps you use logic to put together the rest of, of the context of what we face. I would tell you right now, this instant, computer engineering, nuclear physics, guidance and control systems, advanced feedback systems, if you believe the geometric progression of computer technology, in 10 years we'll be able to build a computer that's fast enough and has enough memory to replicate the human brain. We have no clue how the human brain works. So getting at that edge of technology, I think, is where we need to go. That's an inadequate answer. I'd like to welcome you to New Mexico. My name is Brian Whitehorse. I'm from New Mexico Tech, also called New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology. And uh, last night, we heard some uh, fabulous uh, presentations about uh, nuclear energy. And one of the questions that was brought up is why does the submarine technology uh, and their nuclear power not be applied to the civilian world? Uh, is the defense industry or the defense organizations uh, working to, to help reduce that? And, and is, is there any more initiatives on that? I can't speak to individual initiatives. I can tell you that uh, our Navy nuclear power enterprise is the safest nuclear power enterprise on the planet without fear of contradiction. Um, we, are, we are rigidly disciplined about how we manage our reactors and how we design them, field them, and use them. Um, it's interesting that less than an hour ago, um, one of the cadets asked me about uh, what the consequences of, and I'll just call it a broader war in the Middle East, might mean, and I, and I gave the following answer. How do you feel about oil at $300 a barrel? And I don't mean that to say putting fuel in your F-150 would cost you $12 a gallon. Fuel at $300 a barrel is a strategic vulnerability for the nation because all of our services 
all of our defense mechanism would screech to a halt. We are the single largest consumer of petroleum-based fuels in the country, save one, production of electrical power. And so if access to fuel becomes a vulnerability for our military services, it's a huge strategic vulnerability. Nuclear power has the promise of helping solve that problem in part, in part. I answer the rest of the question this way. If we bought Chevy Volts today, which one of us would know how much it costs to operate? I only pick on the Chevy because as far as I know, the only ones that have a fully electric car. But what would it cost us to operate it? It's carbon neutral, I know that. I've had a thousand engineers tell me that. I question that, by the way. Power's gotta come from somewhere. What does it cost to operate? I drive a fossil fuel powered car. I know it costs me nine cents a mile to drive it. I'm an engineer, I do that kind of work. <laughs> nine cents a mile for me to get to the Pentagon every single day. What does it cost to run an all electric car? I have yet to have an engineer answer that question. I know when I plug that beauty into my garage outlet, the meter outside my house is going to spin faster. How much faster? Because it gets to your question, which is what kinds of non-renewables, nuclear, and renewables do we need to bring into our economy to make this not a strategic vulnerability? Second question, what kinds of propulsion systems do we need to invent for our defense systems that minimize our reliance on petrochemicals, that allow us to fight independent of the fuel source that powers our weapons? That is a really hard question. That's one of the technologies, and to get to your question, that we need to be thinking about. When I talk to academic institutions, I usually challenge them with, how do you give me a hydrocarbon-free supersonic airplane? No plastics, no fuel. Help me understand how to do that. And I would ask the same question about vehicles, about chips, about the whole menu of things that power our economy. That's green technology we can all sign up to. Nuclear may not be the answer, it's certainly part of the answer. Yes, sir. General, much of what you describe, uh, much of what you describe uh, requires very intelligent, energy-hungry satellites. How are we doing on that front? I'm not sure I completely understand the energy-hungry satellites part. In order to have all of these capabilities that you described, much of that goes, has to go some way or another through. I'm with you. The, be the, the beauty of building a satellite that has the satellite as in orbiting the planet that has the power to move this kind of stuff, I would argue happens on two levels. One is solar power is free in space, and nuclear power is sort of less dangerous in space, although I'm not saying we should send satellites up with nuclear reactors on them. But solar power in space is, for all intents and purposes, free. The second is we have a choice, and I don't know the answer to this choice. It's either build more smaller satellites or build more effective big satellites. If I were in the satellite building business, I'd opt for the latter. I'd build the power plant in space. And I'm not talking about beaming power down to Earth. I'm saying, I can build you a satellite that'll generate power, and I'll rent you a space on it. You tell me what kind of transponder you want. You build it, you bring it. You tell me what kind of power you need, I'll provide it. Those kinds of, we call them buses, I don't, I'm not sure why, the technology exists to build them, the motivation to build them, and the economies of scale may not exist. So we've got to think our way through that and then decide which way we go. A thousand small satellites are less vulnerable than one big satellite, I get that. But we not be, may not be able to launch the thousand small satellites 
in time to make up for the big satellite. So we've got to find the balance between the two. You tell me I'm done, I'm done. We're on time. Uh, General, first again, I, I want to thank you. I, I, I didn't expect to see you. I, I, I know you know who I expected to see, but I, I want you to know uh, we understand and we're very pleased that he sent you. Uh, you did a great job and, and we appreciate it. I want to ask you something about the nuclear arsenal, America's nuclear arsenal. Um, while the world's changing and you know, it's, it's no longer two countries and mad, um, nonetheless, our uh, nuclear stockpile is very important and it's very, very old. And it's uh, very, very difficult to maintain and to be sure of just what it is. We have a new program to to investigate its inerts. Uh, I was privileged to run that appropriation-wise from its inception until now. And it seems to work, one where we're looking at the pieces uh, with various new kinds of technology to, to study whether things are still valid that are part of this big machine. Uh, but uh, Soviets have, Russians have a different kind of warhead, a different kind of nuclear weapon. And I just wonder uh, if you could discuss with us the uh, politics of modernization of that fleet and uh, what, just what is the situation from your standpoint um, because we have not been able to modernize it uh, because of congressional inaction. Yes, sir. Politics aside, um, the president gave a pretty good speech not too long ago where he talked about his objectives for the nuclear disarmament talks, SALT follow-on talks, or START follow-on talks that were engaged in with the Soviets. And, and one of the quotes that sticks with me from that speech is, he envisions a world where there are no nuclear weapons. But he's not naive. Later in the speech, he says, but until we reach that goal, the arsenal we have must be safe, reliable, and secure. And so I think that gets to the heart of the matter with the follow-on warheads that would populate such a nuclear arsenal. And that is to be able to assert the safety of the existing arsenal. That work is being done at the national labs, and, but mostly by simulation to determine the individual moving parts or non-moving parts of the warheads to assert to relative certainty with modeling technologies that they are in fact safe. The reliable and secure piece is a different problem. And, and that speaks to the requirement for a new, more capable, more reliable piece of technology or set of technologies that exist to field a smaller nuclear arsenal. But the two go hand in glove. If we are unsuccessful in asserting the security, the reliability, and the safety of our arsenal, we will be naked when we try to negotiate with the Russians and potentially the Chinese, the Koreans, and others in the future to reduce the number of warheads in the global arsenal to that goal of zero. So we've got to get past this notion of maintaining essentially antique warheads. I mean, I've got a 1979 MG in my garage. I know how much work it takes to get that beauty on the road. That's the amount of work it takes to keep our nuclear arsenal safe, reliable, and secure. That is fraught with the potential for error or catastrophe. So what we, we desperately need to be able to do is adequately articulate the requirement, that would be our job, for what the acceptable level of reliability and security is, and then get that and keep it in the debate. But as long as we are sitting across the table from the Russians, we have to be able to assert that our arsenal is in fact reliable. And, and that goes a long way. If we show any amount of weakness, if we show any amount of, of doubt in how good our arsenal is, then it negates all of our arguments at the negotiating table. 
So we owe it to the nation, both as the academic community that builds the models and supplies the information that helps us understand how that arsenal works and, and how long it's viable, to the people who use and maintain that arsenal to be able to assert that we are always ready should we be called upon to put it to use. Those are the two components that make negotiations successful. And then it's up to the people who sit at the table to hammer out the details of the, of the diplomacy and the politics between two countries. But it's bigger than just the two of us, as you know. Uh, but I think much of that work gets done right here in New Mexico in terms of the academic and intellectual work that's the backstop for how we maintain that arsenal. And, and we appreciate it a lot. So I want to, again, thank you all for the opportunity to come here. Uh, it's, it's been interesting. Uh, and I use that word in its, its best intended case. Uh, when I have a chance to interact with people and, and learn a little bit about what's on their minds, then I grow for it, and that means I can take that information back and help the joint staff grow for it, and hopefully the whole community moves forward together. I, I compliment you on what your institute's doing, and, and I really do appreciate the opportunity to come speak to you today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, General. You know, those topics that you discussed on national security, that's exactly why this conference and this institute has been established here at New Mexico State, so we can visit about those kinds of issues that are very important to our national security and our national well-being. And so, in appreciation of the preceding was a production of New Mexico State University. The views and opinions in this program are those of the author and do not necessarily represent the views and opinions of the NMSU Board of Regents.